my God, I just thought Iceland. I just, that's amazing. <laughs> Excellent. Hi, welcome everybody. My name is Nina Jane. I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library. And I had to like take a second because I think Rochelle said somebody is here from Iceland, which is probably one of the furthest places we've ever seen anybody from. So, wow, um, this is going to be fabulous. Um, but we're in Massachusetts. Rochelle is um, not in Massachusetts, but close by. And um, we are excited to be chatting with her about her new book about Judy Bloom, which, as you all know, is she's a warrior for literacy and she is written books that we remember as children and, and we actually remember as adults as well. We were just talking about that a second ago. Before we get to Rochelle, though, I do want to say a couple of things. One is I'd like to thank the Friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our programs. I would also like to thank Rochelle for letting us share this program with other libraries because I think, and anybody who knows me knows that I think when libraries work together, we can make magic. So um, that is this program. It's a magical program. Um, I'd like to let you know that you can buy signed books by Rochelle from Aesop's Fable. I will try to put a link in the chat for that. If I forget, I will send send an email to everybody after the program. Not forget, if I run out of time or if I like the chat's going by too fast or our conversation's going too fast, if you have questions for Rochelle, please put them in the Q&A, which is a button at the bottom of your screen, and I will moderate them to her as we talk. We are not doing a presentation. We just, this is an hour long, free for all. Q&A, <laughs> and Rochelle has been warned. So um, so off we go. Rochelle Bergstein, thank you so much for being here to talk about your book. I'm going to read the whole title because it's so good. The Genius of Judy, How Judy Bloom Rewrote Childhood for All of Us. And um, that's like a thousand percent true for me. So welcome. Thanks so much for being here. And tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into the book. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I love libraries. I'm just getting lost in the chat, seeing where everybody is. I think these Zoom programs are amazing. Um, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I live here with my husband and my eight-year-old son. Um, I'm a writer, obviously. This is my third book. My first two books were on shoes and diamonds. So I like to say that I write books about things that women tend to love and get invested in and that other people um, sometimes regard as frivolous. Mm -hmm. So even though Judy Bloom seems like a little bit of a departure from some of those previous commodity histories, um, I do feel in my mind anyway, she really does fit in because it, she's someone that's so meaningful to women and who, and I'm sure we'll get into this, but who was dismissed for a long time in her career as um, not being serious literature. Mm -hmm. Right. Especially because she started out as a children's right, uh, children's author, like book, like we've all read Super Fudge and Tales of the Fourth Grade, nothing. Um, well, I want to say I have read them <laughs> probably <Me too>. multiple <laughs> times. <laughs> so I don't want to assume about anything, but um, if you haven't, you should. Um, so let's go back a little bit before we start talking about Judy. Uh, were you always a reader when you were a kid? Yes. Very much so. I read anything I could get my hands on. Um, it was my hobby. It was my escape. I just loved to read. And um, pretty much as soon as I could talk, I was telling people I wanted to be a writer when I grew up. So I am truly living my dream, which is so awesome. Um, it changed as I grew up. You know, when I was a little girl, I wanted to be the author and illustrator of children's books. Um that is not what I became. You know, I wanted to be a fiction writer when I was a teenager. And I ultimately discovered that I really love writing nonfiction. So that's kind of where my career landed. Mm -hmm. um, and so when, when did you, um, what was your journey to being published? Did you take, like, were you a creative writing major in college and then start writing? And, or did you have to, did you get an agent like when you were 12? What, ha what happened? <laughs> I did not get an agent when I was 12. Um, I was an English literature major in college. I was not a creative writing major. I took some creative writing classes, um, but I was like really into literary theory. Um, I wrote my senior thesis on Lolita by Nabokov. Mm -hmm. um, I was really excited about getting like a serious, diversified English lit education. Um, after college, I moved to New York City um, I started waitressing 
for money and also because it seemed like a great job to have if you wanted to be a writer. Um, I thought romantically I would cocktail waitress at night and write by day. That's not how it went. I was up all night and then I would sleep all day and do my laundry. And um, that year I spent cocktail waitressing really didn't advance my career in any way. But what did advance my career was that I got a job at a literary agency as um, a bottom rung assistant. I mean, I was filing, I was answering phones, I was reading the slush pile. Um, but I learned a ton about the industry that I wanted to work in. And I think that that was really formative for me. I also was kind of investigating the idea of working in book publishing instead of being a writer. Mm -hmm. You know, when you tell people you want to be a writer, everybody says, you know, good luck to you. It's a tough journey. I hope you like eating canned beans. <laughs> you know, I remember once, I actually have never told this story publicly, but once I answered the phone at the literary agency where I worked, where we had a very prestigious client list. And um, I picked up the phone to a very frustrated writer who had a pretty high profile career. He wrote for the New Yorker and um, he was really angry about something. I can't remember what, but he said to me unprompted, if you want to be a writer, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> because he was so angry and frustrated with his career. Um, needless to say, I didn't listen. Um, I ended up really connecting with an agent at the literary agency where I worked. Um, and he ultimately became my agent and he still represents me. Um, we've worked together for 20 years. So mm -hmm. I got lucky in that regard. I found my agent very fast. Mm -hmm. And um, Pat asks, and I have the same question, why do you love writing nonfiction? And I want to add to that a little bit because nonfiction seems like it's a, an even tougher book a genre to get into for women than um, any other genre. So why nonfiction? I love the research. Going into a library archive, spending hours reading old things really excites me. Mm -hmm. Um, I see it as a treasure hunt. Um, I see it as a puzzle and research and reporting just speak to me. Um, I find it extremely satisfying. I also, you know, some writers will say they have, um, blank page anxiety. I do not have that. I love sitting down to a blank page, but, um, I like constraints. It turns out fiction is so open-ended, you know, what world are you going to create? What characters are you going to create? You're just endless possibilities. And that's kind of overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, so nonfiction, it has, it has walls, you know, you're creating a map, but you have to work within a certain framework. And I really, I really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer because I think that it can be intimidating to a lot of people, not just women, but like anybody, because be, not just because of the research, but because, um, readers are, I don't want to say terrible, but we're very particular. <laughs> and, you know, when you get something wrong, you know, we are not super forgiving. Have you encountered that? Um, thankfully, no, no. I mean, I haven't had an experience where someone's really called me out for getting something wrong. Like I've had, you know, when books go through multiple printings, if anybody writes and says, you know, this needs a little correction or whatever, you can fix it. Mm -hmm. But I've never had something so outrageously wrong in one of my books that I've had to deal with that. Like knock on wood, that seems like a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, it can be. And I'm just talking for myself. I know the uh, readers here are not as bad as I am, but I'm always like, what? <laughs> if it pulls you out of the story, I guess. But um, I've actually never, ever called up or talked, uh, you know, emailed an author to complain to them about their books. Because I figure... If you've written a book, you've done something magical to me that I could never do. I mean, I think if an author got something like really egregiously wrong, they'd want to know. Um, but hopefully you find that out in the copy edit stage. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> um, great copy editor editors are really a wonderful asset to books. <laughs> I completely agree. And we could talk about publishing in a little bit if we have time, but um, I'm very curious about some, some aspects of publishing right now. But let's get into um, the Judy Balloon book because I, I also hope we have a little time for your other books because I like the way you describe them. But 
Um, why Judy? Why? What was appealing or dr what drew you to Judy Bloom's story? Um, I grew up loving Judy Bloom. I mean, like so many young girls and women, you know, I'm an exennial. I'm on the cusp. So, I mean, <laughs> women my age, a lot of women my age really, really love Judy Bloom. Um, there's a selfish aspect to writing, you know, what or who do I want to spend a few years with? And Judy seemed really appealing. Um, so I started playing around with the idea and then I reread, are you there? God, it's me, Margaret. And it kind of blew me away because I hadn't read it since I was a little girl and I couldn't believe how, for lack of a better word, contemporary and still relevant it felt. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, there are a few like 70s era details that stand out. But overall, in terms of the feelings of being an adolescent girl, I felt like it just stood up in a way that so many books don't. Mm -hmm. And considering how old it is, that book was published in 1970. So I was really impressed with that. And it really encouraged me to continue on with this topic. Um, I also, although we've read so many um, appreciations of Judy Bloom. Um, I hadn't read anything that was able to give context to why she's still so beloved when so many authors from her era, like Betty Miles, like Norma Klein, um, aren't writers that we're really talking about anymore. Like, what is it about Judy that has made such an impression on generations of women? Mm -hmm. um, so that was something that animated this project. You know, is there an answer to that question? Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, somebody in the chat did ask, what's the ideal age to read Judy? And I, we were talking about this a little bit before is that she writes, you know, tales of a fourth grade, nothing, but then she also writes wifey. So like, she's got this huge range. So, but what is, when she, when talking about, she actually even writes picture books. So um, what would you say is an ideal or a good age to start with Judy? My son is eight, almost nine. And when I was writing this book, we read some of the fudge books together. So that was extremely fun. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just put that out there. But I think seven was a great age for those books. Mm -hmm. um, he could see himself in both fudge, who's a wild toddler, and Peter, who is an aggrieved older brother. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think for Judy's books that are geared towards younger kids, seven is a great age to read them together. It was very fun. Um, for some of her more iconic books, like Margaret, I don't know, I would say 10 or 11 would be a great age to read books, those books. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, you can start them young, I think. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because um, I just was looking at the order of Judy's books and um, Margaret and Dini are both on her YA and adult list because they have such topics. And I wanna go back to what you said about um, reading, um, Are You There, Margaret? And being kind of blown away with it. Is it because you, you'd read it before and maybe learned, found new things to appreciate from it as a as an, somebody older than when you first read it? Yeah, I think that's certainly true. I mean, I remember reading it as a young person and being skeptical as I went into it thinking, are you there, God? I mean, I don't know if this is really something that, that it sounded so serious, right? And the first, the first line of the book is Margaret praying. I wasn't religious. I thought, I don't know if this is going to be for me, but it totally sucked me in. Going back as an adult, what stood out to me was the religious conversation that's happening in the book. Um, that was something that I noticed as a kid and coming from a dual faith house, household, it really spoke to me. But the way we talk about Margaret is mostly as Judy Bloom's menstruation book, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's where it's been positioned in our cultural memory as a book about periods. And it is very much a book about periods and stuffing bras and whatever, but it's also a book about a young girl, an adolescent girl or pre-adolescent girl figuring out her relationship to God and religion. And that is a very mature. Um, so I think that impressed me that Judy Bloom was putting that kind of um, level of thinking into the mouth of a pre-adolescent character and trusting her readers to get it. Mm -hmm. So when you started writing about um, Judy, let's let's uh, go to this question, which asks, how long did it take you to write the book, including the research? 
Mm. Well, let's see. I started the research when I wrote the book proposal, probably about two and a half years total. Oh, okay. Yeah. That is, doesn't seem that long for such a, such an intense book. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, I really dove into it and, um, my editor wanted it rather quickly. Mm -hmm. You okay. know, when I pitched this book, Judy Bloom was on the upswing in terms of our cultural imagination. Um, and we both thought that she would continue to rise, which she then did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, her documentary came out, the Are You There God movie came out. So um, yeah, she wanted it pretty quickly. So I, I, um, I put my head down and I worked. <laughs> uh, you have to, and you have to get, uh, you have a deadline. So um, I want to ask if you feel like Judy, you said she had sort of a resurgence in the last few years, which is absolutely true. Um, did she go through these kind of things before though? Because you said that she hasn't had an impact on women, especially throughout her, her uh, lifetime of writing. Um, so through the seventies, eighties, nineties, was she having any pushback to her books at, at that time? It's so fascinating because Judy wrote what would become her most controversial books in the 1970s and mm -hmm. early 1980s. But she wrote, you know, she published Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret in 1970. She published Deanie in 1973. She published Forever in 1975. And these books, while maybe a reviewer would remark on the content or say something snarky, um, she wasn't getting the kind of cultural pushback that she started to get in the 80s. Um, at the end of the 70s, a conservative movement really started brewing in this country. Um, Jerry Falwell started the Moral Majority. Um, Phyllis Schafly started the Eagle Forum. And it reached an apex when Ronald Reagan was elected in 1981. Mm -hmm. So it was around that time in the early 80s that Judy started experiencing um, censorship and started experiencing her book being rejected from school libraries. Um, she was on the end of letter writing campaigns uh, to her publisher, you know, with right leaning people telling her publisher that they shouldn't be publishing her because she um, was writing inappropriate things for children. Phyllis Shafley um, circulated a pamphlet called How to Re Rid Your Schools and Libraries of Judy Bloom Books. So she really became a target mm -hmm. in the 80s. Um, she got through it and that died down, you know, as the culture shifts, things um, ebb and flow. But now we're seeing, um, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, but we're seeing a real resurgence of those book challenges now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean... We could definitely talk about it, but I want to go back to, I think we just jumped right into this, to, to my questions. And um, Susan is pulling us back and saying, can you please give us some details regarding the format and content of your book? What is it actually about? <laughs> oh, sure. Okay. So my book is, I consider it part biography, part cultural history. So it's the story of Judy Bloom as a very young housewife and mom who discovers writing and then goes on to write some incredibly influential and iconic books, including Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, The Fudge Series, um, It's Not the End of the World, Then Again, Maybe I Won't, Forever, I could go on and on. Mm -hmm. um, so it's partly Judy Bloom's story, but it's also the story of those books and the impact that they had on the culture, the way that they reflected the culture from which they came and the way that they changed it. Mm -hmm. So the scope of the book, it starts in the late 1960s and it ends in the late 1980s. Oh, okay. So it doesn't actually come up to current day. Mm -mm. Okay. Um, <laughs> I have to laugh, I laugh at this question because we were talking about it a little bit earlier. Um, Lisa asks, what was Judy Bloom's reaction when you told her you were doing this book? I'm assuming that you had contact with her. I did have contact with her. Um, she did not participate. So, you know, I can't really speak to that. You'd have to ask her what she was thinking when she declined, but I did spend a lot of time in her archives at Yale, which are wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, the archives were actually closed because of the pandemic. 
And the minute that they reopened, I said to my husband, like, I have to get in the car and go to New Haven. I have to go see these archives because we, again, we didn't know what was happening with the pandemic and if things were to close again. So I was able to spend a lot of time there. And um, I read, you know, countless interviews that she's done over the years, watched interviews. So um, I feel like I've spent time with her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had talked about the fact that you hadn't met her um, or haven't met her. And then we were plotting how to <laughs> how to do so. Yes. Uh, we'll have to get her to one of your book signings or something like that. That would be really fun. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to this sort of comment in the chat um, that Amy says that Blubber was very um, fun to watch, but painful. And I, I want to talk a little bit about how Judy did that. Like from your perspective on writing this book, how did you see her being able to straddle that, like making it kind of fun, but also talking about these incredible difficult issues in a way that children especially could, um, uh, you know, that found, they found it relatable. Blubber is a tough one. I was actually just talking to another interviewer about this and she was saying she has trouble with Blubber. Um, I remember reading Blubber as a kid and it made my stomach hurt. It's a very cruel book. It's a very tough read. Um, but it reflects something that really does happen, which is senseless bullying of kids who are different mm -hmm. and, um, the sort of mob mentality of bullying that someone who's popular or powerful targets someone who isn't. And then everyone piles on because they want to be aligned with the popular and the powerful, and they don't want to be aligned with the target. And, um, Judy, had, she got in the 80s, she got in a lot of trouble for that book. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the books that was most frequently banned, which actually surprised her because it's one of her books that does not touch upon sexuality. And the reason that people would give for wanting Blubber out of the hands of children was, well, A, it used the word bitch, which people had an issue with, but also um, it didn't have a moral. It doesn't clearly show the kids who engaged in the bullying being punished. It doesn't show the adults um, scolding them. The person who's bullied for most of the book, the titular blubber, um, she becomes a bully in the end. And that's how she gets out of this terrible classroom situation where kids are being so mean to her. So Judy wrote books that reflected real life. And I think that's one of the reasons children responded so well to them. They saw reality reflected in these books. Um, and then in books that are not blubber, I mean, she really does a wonderful job of layering these very accessible, kind of compelling real life stories of kids with um, lessons about puberty and bodies and love and sex and you know, she really had a gift for that. Mm -hmm. And what was it about Judy that made her write about these things in a way that we remember? Uh, Vanessa was just saying she remembers those books, having read them 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about her? What was what was her background, her origin story? Judy was from a middle class Jewish family um, in Elizabeth, New Jersey. She was the daughter of a dentist and a homemaker. Um. She had a fairly happy, if a little bit repressed childhood, like a kind of a typical 1950s childhood. And she was very creative. She um, not only told stories, but she also danced and did school plays and worked on the school newspaper. And she loved it. She also um, was raised with the message that the pinnacle of a woman's success was to marry a husband who could provide for her economically, um, to have children and nurture them and raise them, to live in a beautiful home, um, to keep her husband happy, to cook great meals, to learn to play tennis if her husband wanted to play tennis. And that's what she did. Mm -hmm. um, she was engaged before she graduated from college. Um, she had her first daughter right after she graduated. And um, she, you know, according to the standards of the day, she was set, you know, that was her life and she had done it. Mm -hmm. But she was really unhappy. 
And that unhappiness started coming out in different ways. Um, one of them for her was that she was sick all the time um, and doctors couldn't really explain it. She would get rashes, she would get sore throats, she would have days when she couldn't get out of bed. And it wasn't until she started writing as a creative outlet that that stopped. Mm. So she was bored and unhappy and it was literally making her sick. Mm -hmm. When she started writing, she talks about channeling that younger version of herself. Margaret is very much drawn from her own memories and experiences. And it made her excited to think that through writing, she could kind of get back in touch with the person she used to be. Mm -hmm. What made her pick up the pen? Not just the boredom, but the fact that she was going against what she was supposed to be doing. Yeah. So I, I mean, I loved learning this about Judy Bloom because of course now she's such a cultural supernova that we don't think that she ever struggled, right? She's been famous for so long. So many of us have grown up always the knowing the name Judy Bloom. So what I was kind of interested and inspired to learn is that her path to success as a writer wasn't straightforward. Um, she started just thinking to herself, you know, I need to do something creative. That's what made me happy as a kid. So she would wash dishes and she'd sing along to the radio and she'd think, uh, maybe I'm going to write pop songs until she realized she doesn't really have a gift for writing pop songs. Um, she liked to craft and she actually made pennants to hang in children's rooms that she sold briefly in Bloomingdale's. Mm -hmm. um, but she had to stop doing that because she developed an allergy to the fabric glue she was using. So I love that detail. It's like if she could have withstood the fabric glue, we would have never gotten Judy Bloom books. You know, it's just so funny. It's like the randomness of life. But um, after that, you know, she read to her kids like many creative parents do. And um, she thought to herself, I could probably, I could probably write a children's book. And she started just writing and doodling little drawings and, um, she wasn't great at it. You know, it wasn't like she was an overnight success. She wasn't necessarily completely natural at it. Um, and then she got a brochure in the mail from her alma mater, NYU, and it, there was a class being offered for adults called Writing for Children and Teenagers. So she took the class and this was like a really special thing for her. She got to go into the city one night a week and leave the kids at home with her husband. And, um, she liked the class so much that she took it twice and she made a connection with her teacher in that class who helped her kind of identify what her strengths were as a writer. So she started writing picture books, writing short stories, writing fantasy, writing books in first person, writing in third person. And um, that teacher encouraged her to stick with realistic fiction. She said, I think that's really where you have a knack for this. And Judy was, she became ambitious. She started sending out her manuscripts to magazines that posted, that um, published fiction for children. She started sending drafts to publishers and she was rejected all over the place. Every major publisher in New York rejected her mm -hmm. until they didn't. And she published the one in the middle of the green kangaroo. And she was able to get some momentum under her and keep going. Mm -hmm. Um, can I just go back to one point that you had said um, that she was able to go to the class once a week and are like the kids with her husband. So was her husband supportive of this? I hate to ask this question, but was her husband supportive of her uh, ambition to do this? You know, it sounds like he was sort of supportive. She said later that he would make jokes that, oh, just give Judy, you know, a pencil and some paper and she's happy. It seems that he was happy to support her as long as it didn't really interfere with her wifely duties, you know? Mm -hmm. So as long as she was getting dinner on the table and she was picking the kids up from school and everyone's needs were being met, he didn't really care if she wrote in her free time. But it doesn't seem like he was really excited about her having a career as a writer. It was more like, oh, okay, if this is making you happy, that's an uh, inexpensive way <laughs> for you to have a hobby. Mm -hmm. Oh. I, I mean, again, I hate to say this, but like the fact that he was willing to watch the kids one night a week, not that he's a hero or anything, but it, it's, it goes like one step beyond just like totally like, ugh, you know, as long as, you know, as long uh, it, it's not, she's going to be happy. It's more like, okay, I, I will support this in this one way. Interesting. Um, and, 
sorry. No, he um he connected her with a friend of his who had worked in publishing um to read some of her early work and give her some honest feedback and it completely backfired. Um he <laughs> the friend wrote her a letter that basically said grab the tissues because yeah. you don't have it and oh, you should really think about just going back to baking and um you know, her fortitude in pushing forward against rejection and against that kind of feedback is really admirable. Yeah, absolutely. Especially back then when she probably didn't have like a group of women writers or friends who she could like bounce ideas off of, which so many people have now. Um, no, so she did not have a writer's group. And in fact, that was part of the problem. She really didn't connect with a lot of the women in her town she didn't feel like she fit in. You know, they liked playing tennis. They liked playing golf. They gossiped. They shopped to pass the time. And she just didn't feel like those were the ways that she wanted to pass the time. So I think some of her creativity was coming out of a place of loneliness and unfulfillment. Mm -hmm. I also want to go back to the point you said about the, um, the banners that she was making. I feel like the way that you describe that, it's her, it was her body saying like, nope, this is not the thing. <laughs> you right. Know? Right? right. You'd said that she was getting sick and she was, you know, having hives and stuff. And that all went away when she started to write. And then her bot, and then she did this penance and her, her body was like, yeah, that's the wrong direction. Nope. <laughs> I love that thought. It's like the body is smart, right? It, you know, it was giving her a, some feedback about where she should be spending her time and how. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay. So Robin asks, and I asked you this earlier too, did you see the movie version of, are you there? And if so, what did you think about it? I did see it. So, okay. So I was telling Mina, um, I really enjoyed it. I brought a friend from the Netherlands with me. And so she didn't grow up reading Judy Bloom, and it was all new to her. And we both have young boys and we had a blast. I mean, it was, for me, you know, someone who's been steeped in the Judy Bloom experience for years and for her coming from the total opposite end of the spectrum, knowing very, very little about Judy Bloom, we both enjoyed it. That said, um, I do feel that the film attempts to like clean up a couple storylines that didn't need cleaning. Um, to me, one of the most profound moments in Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, the book, is when 11-year-old Margaret lashes out, again, the bullying, she lashes out at a girl in her class named Laura Danker. And Laura is the girl in her class who's taller than everyone and has already hit puberty and has developed, right? And, and because of that, and for that reason only, there are rumors about her that she does things behind the grocery store with boys. Mm -hmm. And um, Margaret, in a moment of weakness and anger kind of piles on Laura and repeats the rumors that she has heard about Laura to Laura. And Laura is so upset and Margaret immediately knows that she did something wrong, right? She immediately feels intense shame, but in the book, she's never able to make it up to Laura. Um, this is just a learning experience for Margaret, right? That when you treat someone like that, you have to live with the consequences. Mm -hmm. And for her, the consequences are the shame and the hope that she'll do better someday. In the movie, and I hope this doesn't you know, spoil it for anyone because this does refer to the ending, but um, we see Margaret reject Nancy, who's kind of her snotty best friend. And you know, in a gesture, like bring Laura onto the dance floor at a graduation party and we're showing we're seeing Margaret, you know, stands up for Laura and in one full swoop, like redeem herself. And to me, that felt like a false note. It felt very Hollywood. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that we all admire so much about Judy's books is that she is willing to tell it like it is. And to, to me, the book version, it was much more like it is in that regard. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to what you had said about Blubber in that there wasn't a resolution that adults could be um happy with that Hollywood ending, as you say, um, because I think that a lot of those times, a lot of those situations don't get resolved. You know, yeah. somebody continues to get bullied. The parents never speak up when they do speak up, it gets worse. Those kind of things. So it's curious that they, that in making this movie, they actually did give it a, you know, that sort of jazzy, like, oh, adults can like this too, kind of thing. Maybe. <laughs> 
One um, change that they made that I did like was that they fleshed out the character of Margaret's mother in the movie. And I think that they did it. I mean, they probably did it because they had Rachel McAdams and you don't want to waste Rachel McAdams, but they did it in a way that wasn't necessarily true to that particular book, but was consistent with mothers in Judy Bloom's oeuvre. Mm -hmm. So um, in the movie, Margaret's mom is really, she's trying to reconnect with painting. She's like searching for who she's going to be in this new town, whether she's going to be the PTA mom, whether she's going to work, whether she's going to be an artist again. Um, and while um, that's not true of the book version of Are You There, God, um, we do see mothers in Judy Bloom's books often asking themselves those questions. Mm -hmm. um, Susan says, and I, I had the same question for you. I didn't get a chance to ask you. Was that, did you know that Judy has a bookstore in Key West and is there often during the winter months? I think she'd be happy to meet you and carry your book. So I think, Matt, Michelle, we need to take a field trip. I agree. Let's all go. Key West <laughs> is awesome. If you've never been there, um, they have wild chickens. It's the weirdest thing ever. They're like pigeons in New York City. There are just chickens that are wandering the streets. It's delightful. I would love to go to Key West and visit Judy. Um, which actually brings me to a question that I had that I was thinking of uh, sort of mulling over before we even started was that um, Judy Bloom lives in Key West. So does Meg Cabot. And um, they're they're friendly, uh, at least on social media. But like Meg Cabot wrote those sort of like um, lighthearted princess books and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then went to write adult books, also very lighthearted. And I just think she's so iconic and she lives near this person who's so like, so different from her. And how much, how awesome that must be to be somebody that you can just talk to with, um, with you could just like go up the street and talk to Judy Bloom. So cool. I mean, I say this in the most affectionate way possible. Key West is a freaky city. <laughs> and I think it probably attracts a really oddball and creative population. Um, and I love that that's where Judy feels at home. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of, it's not the same, but it has a similar vibe to New Orleans. It's just one of those extremely new, new, unique American places. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's really cool. All right, so I'll pick a date. We'll just all go down there and say hello and make sure that she's carrying your book. Book <laughs> Club Pilgrimage. Yes, <laughs> that would be awesome. Yes. Um, so um, Pat has a, a writing type question. Do you write narrative nonfiction or in a more encyclopedic style? Hmm. I mean, I, I want to think it's narrative. Um, <laughs> that sounds way more fun. I try to write narrative nonfiction. And um, like I said, I've written books about objects. This is a book about books. Um, so one of my challenges as a writer has been how to inflect storytelling and interest into immovable things. Mm -hmm. Right. So a lot of my work is about finding the characters that make these stories interesting um, or pulling out the anecdotes or details that really shine. So um, I definitely try to write narratively. Um, I try to do a balance of pulling back the lens and giving context and then zooming in on specific things and moments that are fascinating. Um, yeah. Um, full disclosure, I didn't quite get to finish the book, but I did find it very, very readable. You know, I just really thought you brought Judy to life. And so I would go with narrative nonfiction. <laughs> uh, so let's go back to Judy a little bit. Um, what, what was, what was the most surprising thing you learned in your research about her? Hmm. Well, like I said, that she wasn't an overnight success was really interesting to me. Um, one of my favorite anecdotes from this book is it takes place around her, um, her the, the ending of her second marriage. So Judy Bloom has been married three times. Mm -hmm. And um, the first marriage was to the father of her children. Um, the second marriage was to a man she met on an airplane and she had later said she really rushed into it. They didn't really know each other. You know, she was out of her depth dating in the 1970s with two kids and ended up marrying the wrong person. And then um, her third marriage is to George Cooper, who she remains married to and seems like is her 
intended life partner, her soulmate. Um, but around the end of her second marriage, she had published uh, starring Sally J. Friedman as herself, which I've spoken to many Judy Bloom lovers is actually a favorite of many of her readers. You know, mm -hmm. people really love that book, but the reviewers didn't. It got almost universally panned. Um, it's a little different from some of her other books and the reviewers were really unhappy with it, which hurt Judy's feelings a lot. Um, it seems like she was in, um, you know, a vulnerable place in her life, first of all, with her marriage ending. And second, um, Sally J. Friedman is one of her most autobiographical novels. So she took the criticism probably more personally than she would have with some of her other books, because it really was about her. And she received one or sh one review that was from a, you know, a prominent reviewer, and it called the book disgusting. And Judy couldn't believe it. Like, what a strong word to use about her writing, right? You know, you can not like it, but just call it disgusting. And she was in such a dark place that she picked up her typewriter and she walked outside. She was living in Santa Fe, New Mexico at the time. And she considered hauling her typewriter over the hill where she lived and crashing it into pieces and never writing again. And I feel like as writers, many of us have that moment, mm -hmm. you know, where I'm not talented. I want to turn it, you know, I, I want to pack it in. I'm going to go get a regular job. It's not <laughs> worth it. And Judy was there. Mm -hmm. And um, I found that so relatable and so incredible for an icon like Judy Bloom that she had that moment too. Um, she didn't smash her typewriter, thank goodness. Um, she went back inside the house and she actually did something she had never done before, which is she wrote a letter to that reviewer um, and said, you know, you're entitled to your opinion. I'm sorry you didn't like the book, but to call it disgusting, like what gives? And the reviewer wrote her back and she said, look, I stand by what I said. I didn't like the book. Um, I'm a big fan of yours. I read it twice because I was surprised by my reaction to it. And I, I just don't love it. But the reason I called it disgusting is because you have a scene in which the family orders Chinese food and they they find a cockroach in the chow mein. Mm. And so it was like this one little detail that probably kids find funny um, that almost ended Judy Bloom's career. Right. So, I mean, points to her for actually asking what the problem was, <laughs> but I think that story just really stuck in my mind. is just like an incredible story about a creative person at the end of her tether and, you know, again, picking herself up off the floor and getting back to work. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. And, um, Julie says she remembers that and the kid goes, hot damn, and gets in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, Julie also has a question. It's a strange one, she says, but uh, Margaret develops, get it, develops, gets hair and her period all in a matter of months. I don't think this happens. Is that an oversight on Bloom's part or is it a case of artistic license? Hmm. I don't know if there's reference to body hair in Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret. Um, and I don't think that she actually does really develop breasts. The book is a lot about how she wants to, um, and the ex, you know, the famous exercise, we must, we must, we must increase our bust. She stuffs her bra, but, um, she does get her period at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. And that of course has become a competitive thing among her friends, right? She, um, she's worried she's going to be the last of her friend group to get it. And that seems really humiliating to her, mm -hmm. but I don't know if we get the absolute clear timeline of Margaret's development. It's very fixated on the boobs and the period and the period comes, but I'm not sure about the rest of it. Um, so Julie says, and I recall this too, is that she's looking in the mirror naked and then he, so does talk about what she sees and, and it is development. So <laughs> I don't know why I'm being like so shy about the words all of a sudden. <laughs> Sorry. But um, yeah, there's obviously like we all and maybe we all read it differently and, and see things differently from from our own perspectives. Yeah, that's so interesting. Now I'm going to have to go back and look at that scene and see exactly what she says. Um, but yeah, I mean. I don't know what's normal for everybody, so I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, yes, Julie, I'm trying not to be creepy. 
<laughs> but I'm also an adult. I should be able to say the words. Um, so I'm going to go to uh, this part about Judy being, um, you know, banned in a lot of places back in the 70s and 80s and now happening again. Do you feel like she was a, like, or did she feel like she was a warrior back then as she has been in the last five to seven years? I think she got there. At first, she very much did not feel like a warrior. She was blindsided by the attacks on her books and kind of on her character. Mm -hmm. um, there were editorials in newspapers about how she was not only writing inappropriate things for children, but that she was an inappropriate role model because she had been married and divorced twice. Mm -hmm. um, so it did get personal. Um, she was on an episode of Crossfire where um, Pat Buchanan accused her of being obsessed with masturbation. Um, so it was very tough on her and she was quite despondent about it. You know, she had dedicated her career to writing books for children and then to be told again and again and again, she was bad for kids and harming them. Um, that's really brutal. She ended up connecting with an organization which still exists called the National Coalition Against Censorship. And that's when she started to feel empowered because they had more of a playbook for what to do when your book is challenged and um, gave her an apparatus to support her in all of the various issues that were cropping up all around the country. She was the, the most banned author in America at, for a time in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. So I think she came to embrace her position as a warrior against censorship, but it took time. Mm -hmm. And um just quick question. Was that Pat Buchanan or Pat Robertson? It was Pat Buchanan. Okay. Because both were awful, according to us. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, there seems to be like these waves of, you know, book bannings. But what made her come out this time? Like what made her come out fighting this time? Because she'd been pretty quiet for quite a long time. Maybe it's just nothing was being banned as much. Um. I do think that she has embraced her status as an anti-censorship pioneer. Um, she was also doing a lot of press around her documentary. And I think it was natural for people and reporters to be asking her about the waves of book bans that are now spreading across the country. Mm -hmm. So I think there was, um, you know, some good timing there. But Judy, having been through it, is someone that we all look to for guidance because now um, book bans are scarier than ever. In the 1980s, um, the challenges against books were largely led by grassroots movements, um, the Moral Majority again, the Eagle Forum, right-leaning school boards. Um, now we have all of that. We have groups like Moms for Liberty, but we also have politicians getting involved and trying to create laws um, that make it more and more difficult for kids to access books about sexuality, books about LGBTQ issues, books about the Black American experience are all being challenged right now. And um, we're seeing okay, lots of- Can I just interrupt? Yeah, you go ahead. Recently that they tried to ban Pride and Prejudice because they thought it was a book about pride. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> just had to, I was like, all right, that's it. That's a clip. That's a shark, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Escambia County in Florida, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, they banned the dictionary. I mean, that was the headline for a week because it's so bizarre, you know, where, I mean, I suspect areas like that are using AI and searching for any book with the word sex in it. And, you know, the dictionary comes up. So take away the dictionary. Um, it's really, it's gotten to a fever pitch that's really insane from where I'm sitting and terrifying. I mean, we're talking about jailing school teachers librarians who would have thought that librarians would be at the forefront of the culture wars like this it's a really challenging time mm -hmm. when do you think that judy realized that she could have her voice could have such an impact on these issues um i think when she became something of a poster child for, for book banning um I interviewed Norma Klein's daughter. Norma Klein unfortunately died a long time ago, but her daughter is still alive. And um, her daughter told me that in her office, she had a poster where um, Norma and Judy were on it alongside um, Mark Twain, mm. Shakespeare and Solzhenitsyn. And, you know, Judy and Norma were the two female faces of 
the book banning movement. So whether she liked it or not, she was getting aligned with it. And I think for many strong people, you know, your choice is either to wither or to embrace. So she embraced. We're so glad that she did. It's, yes. Um, I can't tell you as a librarian how wonderful it is to have somebody like Judy Bloom, you know, defending librarians and books and school librarians and uh, bookstores and stuff like that. It just, it's, it's so heartwarming. It's scary too. Um, Vanessa asks, and this is such an unfair question, Vanessa, what is your favorite Judy Bloom book? <laughs> oh, this is, I get asked this and, um, okay. So I have, I have two, like, don't make me choose. I have, are you there? God, it's me, Margaret, for all of the reasons I've said, uh, it, it stands the test of time. It's a beautiful book. It, it, um, captures the, agonies and ecstasies of being a preteen girl in such a perfect way. But I also have a central mental favorite and it's um, just as long as we're together. Oh. And um, that's one of her later books. Um, it's not a book I talk a lot, a lot about in this book, um, but it was the first book that I read where I didn't want my parents to know what I was reading. And um, I asked my dad to stop reading to me before bed so that I could keep reading it on my own. Mm -hmm. So it had a big impact on me. The first, I see someone wrote, that is my favorite too. I love it. The, <laughs> the first line of that book is Stephanie is into hunks and it blew my mind, right? Like it just was like, oh, this is different from anything I've ever read before. Mm -hmm. Did you read all of Judy or most of Judy Bloom when you were younger and then read it again for this book? Or did you discover new books when you started researching? I discovered a lot of her adult catalog when I started researching mm -hmm. this book. So I hadn't gone from being a childhood Judy fan to an adult Judy fan who read all of her adult books. Um, so I had read, I read In the Unlikely Event, which I really liked, but then I went back and read Summer Sisters and Smart Women and Wifey and some books that I had missed, um, which are also great. Mm -hmm. I mean, she just has such a wonderful ear for dialogue and a sense of character that no matter what she's writing, it comes through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And before we started, I told um, Rochelle that um, I read Wifey when I was 12 by accident. Um, I was babysitting. They had it on their bookshelf. I was like, oh, Judy Bloom. <laughs> blew my mind but I read it later as an adult and I was like oh I get it um just as you said just an amazing writer and um you know somebody who really can speak to us at all ages of our lives which I think is something super unique <clears throat> wifey um was Judy's first book for adults and she describes it as another aspect of her life that she felt like she needed to share. Um, wifey, as we were talking about before this event started, it really goes there in the language. I mean, there are very vivid sex scenes. It's really funny. Um, I compare it in my book to Erica Jong's Fear of Flying. It's a similar um, kind of second wave feminist. A housewife busts out of her shell and goes on a sexual journey trying to find herself and um, I still think Wifey is worth picking up. I think it's very entertaining. Um, if you've only read Judy's children's books, you're going to be like, oh, my God, Judy, because some of the language she uses is is wild. Um, but, yeah, I, I think her adult books are equally fun. Yeah, well, I couldn't wait to go back to babysitting because I couldn't read it all in one night. <laughs> Good times. Um, <laughs> so... Were there any of Judy's books that you thought didn't, you didn't like as much? And not to say like they weren't good books, but that you just thought weren't as um, impactful as you, uh, we've been talking about. You know, her first book, Iggy's House, um, her publisher would later say that it wasn't up to the standard of what Judy would become as a writer. And I agree with that. You know, you, it's a first time writer's book. You can tell that it has flaws um but judy's bravery comes through as well mm -hmm. um that's a book about racism in small town new jersey and it was published in 1970 i mean judy 
doesn't shy away from redlining, blockbusting, a, a child, a white child reacting to her parents not standing up against racism and that really like breaking the spell of their perfection for her. So the um, the bones were there, but her gift, it matured in her book, in her next books. So yeah, I would say Iggy House is not my favorite. Um, some of her books from that era, like I don't, I know some people really love Freckle Juice. That's not my favorite. Um, but overall, for a person who's written so many books, so many of them are still so great. Mm -hmm. Right. Like not everyone can be everybody's cup of tea, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Larry says, my wife says, I was a public librarian, but I stay out of culture wars. Um, unfortunately, we are all being pulled into them regardless of, of our of what we want. And I appreciate somebody who can stay out of it because it's so difficult. Um, so I know that J Judy's, your book, Judy, just came out recently, but Lisa and I both want to know what you're working on now. Ooh. I, um, so there's a lot about second wave feminism in this book and I am interested and I'm not totally sure what angle I'm going to take yet, um, but I'm in the very nascent stages. I'm interested in following that thread, you know, kind of picking up where this book leaves off, not with Judy per se, but with the feminist movement. So, you know, in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, um, a new set of feminist thinkers debuted um, and I'm reading a lot of that work right now. It's really fascinating to me. Wow. Um, Ellen asks, what do you think about the inclusion of a black child in Margaret's close friend group in, in, in Are You There, God? I thought it was anachronistic, having grown up in that area a little before that era. Did you think it was as well? Hmm. You know, I, I looked through Judy's yearbook and there were both black and white students in her high school. Um, so as far as areas of the world go, I think Elizabeth, New Jersey was pretty diverse. And um, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't, it's tough for me to answer that question because I was not a child in 1970 making friends. Yeah. <laughs> so I can say, yes, maybe that was a Hollywood flourish because right now we want to see more types of people on screen. And I think that's a good thing. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. Mm -hmm. Um, and just with a couple more minutes, um, do you think anybody is writing like Judy now, not in terms of actual work, but like as impactful for children? I don't know if anyone is as prolific as Judy. Um, I think there are some incredible, not necessarily children's books, but young adult books out there that are making a lot of impact. Like I've read Gender Queer, which I think is a beautiful book. Um, Flamer blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Really gorgeous book. I mean, it's gotten a lot of backlash, but if you just sit down and read it, it is truly a beautiful book. Mm -hmm. um, All Boys Aren't Blue, same thing. So I think a lot of writers are kind of picking up where Judy left off in that they're pushing boundaries and telling untold stories for young people. But I don't know if we've seen anyone with the impact of Judy Bloom emerge yet. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll be keeping a lookout because um, I just don't know how anybody can equal that. Not just a pro being prolific, but being um, hitting so many aspects of the lives of children um, in different books. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we are out of time and this has been fantastic as I expected it to be, Rochelle. Thank you so much for spending your time with us and thank you for bringing this book out, which as I said, for people who love to read, librarian, booksellers, it um, it brings to light something that we're all struggling with that has been happening for so long and yet there's still people fighting it. And so I really appreciate what you've done here. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. This was really a lovely conversation and I really enjoyed it. Great. Okay. Well, I hope you have a wonderful day. We'll look forward to your next book um, and enjoy this current one. And I, we never had to talk about your shoes and um, 
what was it? Shoes and diamonds. Shoes and diamonds. Yes. We'll have to look for those because I'm sure that they're just as fascinating as this one. So um, I hope you have a wonderful night for everybody who's here. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the special conversation. And I hope you read Judy and I hope you love it as much as I am. So I, I thank you all. Thank you, Mina. Have a good night, everyone.